Hello and welcome to the Heresy Lodge. I am your host, Dylan Cooper, the constant ghost over here. Gavin Franklin. Also known as Player 3947. 9974. Like <laughs> I changed my name to Imperial Janitor. I thought it fit pretty well. <laughs> Perfect. Guys, this week we are previewing Path of Heaven. Last week we kind of did like a mix of our special episode and finished up I Have Terra. So we figured it made most sense to go on to our next book. Before we get into that, though, we have our socials. Uh, at Heresy We're Lodge, social. at Gmail, no, at Heresy Lodge is our Twitter. Find our Discord pinned to that. Get in there. It's a lot of fun. It's not for everyone. It's a little raunchy. But it's a good time. We had a happy Disc- meetup this last week, and it was fun. <laughs> I think... Uh... I almost feel like once we said it was raunchy, more people joined. I'm a little concerned for our audience members. <laughs> Wait, they got butt plug gifts? We're in. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> sent a video yesterday. I don't know if you saw it. They sent a video of um, like, I don't know, a demolition ranch kind of YouTube channel where they tested oh, yeah. a, a butt plug gun, literally. <laughs> they were like, can you kill somebody? With a butt plug, and it turns out you absolutely can. Doran's in there rubbing his hands together, like I fucking knew it. <laughs> you have to get more butt plugs than they. <laughs> um, also, you can email us at theheresylodge at gmail.com to get the link. We are on YouTube as well. Please go over there, like, subscribe. And also, if you're on the Twitter and feel like contributing to the podcast, we have tips enabled. We also started playing Tacticus, our guild's full. But I will respect you for playing as well. Yeah, I don't know if it's full of like Heresy Lodge members since it's a public one. I don't know. It, it filled up in like three minutes. Yeah. And so I had I to feel... start kicking people for Yeah. Guys. So if, if you join Tacticus and you're on the Discord and you let us know that you're there, we might be able to find you a spot pretty easily. Yeah, I'll find one of those no name bastards that don't help in the guild fights. I, I actually don't help with the kill fights. You might need to kick me out. It's a good thing I promoted you in there. I am uh, I am very bad at mobile games. I'm not a huge fan of them, but I'll, I'll You're not try. Good and... at games. I'm actually not I'm bad at games. I'm I'm not even like I'm not even good at Warhammer. Yeah, I heard you lost to some Imperial Guard. Yeah, so let's talk about that actually, because this was <laughs> this is an interesting uh, Wait, tidbit. Before we get to that, you should tell me what you're drinking because you uh, probably need it. <laughs> okay, yes, I do. So I went to a winery this weekend um, called Talon Winery, and I got this is amazing. It's a blueberry porter, and it's aged in um, a bur- Kentucky bourbon barrel, and it is it's very mead tasting. Tastes I, a lot like it, yeah. I I am a huge fan of porters. I can. They're good, them. very heavy in alcohol though, and also very sweet. Oh yeah, all the above. How about <laughs> you? I am drinking from Stone Brewing, the Tangerine Express Hazy IPA. It's a good, good one. Yeah, it's a quality beer. Yeah, as I saw the word pineapple when I was like looking at it, I was like, oh, I'm gonna drink me a pineapple beer. I hate the word hazy, like in drinks. Every time I think of hazy, I, this is going to sound really weird, but I'm like, what does it do to my insides? Like, what is my what is my pee going to look like after this? That's what I think of. I think of diabetes. I don't know. It just like goes straight. <laughs> that is my like, that I is know, weird. <laughs> very weird conversation to start off. <laughs> Dude, hazy IPAs are like the only IPAs I actually like because they're, good. they're like super hoppy. Yeah, they're good IPAs. Yeah, for sure. I would definitely order a hazy IPA most of the time over an IPA, unless there's certain ones that I like. Yeah. So the tournament, I went to a tournament last weekend. I'll be going to a tournament this weekend, too. So I'll, I'll, I'll send some updates trying to like rev up to as much tournament play as possible before we get to the US Open. Uh, but yeah, I actually, it was kind of weird. So I went one and two. I lost two games and I got third place at the tournament. What? How'd that happen? (laughs) Yeah, so it's a little weird. A lot of RTTs. Actually, I'm not sure how many of these events do this. I don't think a lot of them, like the larger ones do, but some RTTs do, where it's 100% points-based. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, which is weird, but also, I don't know. I kind of want to discuss a little bit. It's interesting. Um, But basically, my first game, I went against tank commanders, and they 
dominated. Uh, they scored 299 points in the event, losing one point to Meek. <laughs> hey! Uh, I yeah. did it! <laughs> <laughs> um, and they were just crazy. Tank commanders are nasty. Like, they, right now, um, Imperial Guard just received buff after buff after buff, and they're good. Like, they pretty much have secondaries that are auto scores. Um, their tanks are OPSEC. And they have a two up armor save, their toughness eight, and they get armor content. Very nice. That's very scary. Bolters are wounding them on sixes. <laughs> it's very interesting seeing like Imperial Guard like stats because like the people that like are really good at them will, you know, like win events. And then there's like the complete opposite spectrum, which is most of their players. Yeah. It's like 3% win rate. <laughs> The Imperial Guard is very interesting because I really, I think you kind of hit it on on the head, the nail on the head there, because a lot of people who play Imperial Guard are just like really into Imperial Guard, like playing them, not necessarily playing them well. They just like the idea (laughs) of like humans killing aliens and space marines and stuff. Um, And so they just bring nonsense to the table to just play, which is cool. Like I've never been upset playing an Imperial Guard player. However, there are times though I'm like, this army is ridiculous. When I see like 12 <laughs> tanks across the table from me, I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> there are 100 points each. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cheaper than my unit of breachers. Great. <laughs> Not really, but it's close. Um, yeah, so having like offset tanks that are that hard to move, like they do damage to 2d6 shots, um, d6 damage. For each of those. The thing is, though, like with like D6 stuff, is Sweet. man, you hit those sixes and you're like, oh, fuck, yeah. And then you're, then you're me and you roll ones. And you're like, cool. Yeah. I mean, you have <laughs> seven tank. He had seven of them, though. So, like, he was going to roll high eventually. And, like, he did get very lucky. I think, like, if, if there were some, there was a couple mistakes I made, but he got, he got very lucky on his rolls. Um, my plasma rifles were basically pushing him to f- five ups. Um, and he made like some really clutch five ups. Um, so that was pretty rough. Um, second game was against Death Guard. That's now my favorite army to face because, like, I don't think it's possible to lose Tau versus Death Guard. <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of um, basically what I did was uh, uh, I went Kunyan, which is like exploding shots in the turn three, four, and five. And I go first, and he's like, oh, are you going to take the middle? I'm like, nope. I'm just going to sit back here. Did he have Mortarion? <laughs> he didn't have Mortarion. Oh, Mortarion, cool. I mean, yeah. The problem is exactly what he said. If he had Mortarion, that would have been amazing, because I had two hammerheads. <laughs> Mortarion yeah. would have just been eliminated and <laughs> a quarter of his army gone. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he just had a bunch of Plague Marines, and it was, it was fine. The, Won that one. Lost against Blood Angels by one point. One point, though. And it was so sad. It was actually crazy because I ended I ended up with um as far as like points on the table, how much I had left. I had about probably uh, fourteen to fifteen hundred of my points left. And he had about three hundred of his points left. Damn. Um and he won by a point. Yeah. And I think like the more Did I played, go five turns. Yeah, five rounds. The more I played Blood Angel, play against Blood Angels, it's very much just like understanding their secondaries. A lot of it is keeping them out of your deployment zone, that kind of stuff. So I think like I'm learning as I'm playing Blood Angels uh, against them. So it's kind of good. But yeah, anyway, I lost two games, but I scored above 70 points on all of them. So that ended up scoring me third place, which is kind of interesting. It's something I want to talk about because the way tournaments typically are scored is win loss, which I think I prefer. Like, there were people that went 3-0. There was a guy that went 3-0 and got fourth place. Um, do I think I could have beaten that guy's army? I didn't face him. Um, yeah, I think so. I think I absolutely could have. But um, it's a really strange question to ask. Like, should I think it almost needs to be, like, a weighted system in some part. Like, a win is worth X amount of points. But, like, say you score over, like, 70. I don't know. 70 is pretty high. But I think if you lose and you score over 70, that should be also something in your favor to like some sort of like weight. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense to like 
to make it point based, but to do something like a win is worth an additional 20 points. So if yeah. you win 20 points extra in the tournament, um, that would have shut me down pretty hard. But yeah, it's interesting because points is how you score in a game. So even though you're losing games, people that are winning games are maybe scoring less points than you. Yeah. How do you judge that? You know, it's very weird. I, I think that's why the win loss system is probably the better system to go by. Like, I think that's fine. I would have been upset. Like, I'm not over here. Like, I, I don't think I deserve third place. Uh, yeah, it's also just one of those things, too, where, like, it's strength of schedule almost, too. Mm-hmm. And, like, unless it's, like, a like a good tournament bracket, mm-hmm. like, who knows what that's going to be like, especially in a three-rounder. Yeah, three rounds is weird. I can, like, because three rounds, the real problem is you can get up to, like, 20, maybe, I think, 30 people's max RTT, and you're not going to get to, like, number one winner. So what happens is, like, the person with the most points just takes it. Um, And that always, most of the time, and this is why I've never run into this situation, most of the time that ends up being um, the people that have gone 3-0. Yeah. Um, But that was not the case actually as a matter of fact the guy that got second was the blood angels player i faced i missed second place by five points Damn. i missed our game <laughs> by one second place by five points and everybody else who was like ranked up there like that 3-0 player just like was averaging like 55 points a game for a win which i think is crazy low, that's super low yeah yeah that's very low um so the other the other players were that were scoring well all went up against the tank commanders list and get scored like t- maybe 15 points 20 points <laughs> it was so sad so they got like they got like destroyed by that um so it's a very interesting concept i think um to score by points i don't see a huge issue with it the problem is you get paired with people based off of the points that you scored yeah. So like your second round, you're going to basically the way you can typically tell what you're being paired with is you go, OK, the top two players based off their points, then the next two, then the next two, then the next two. Then. And then that's typically how RTT score the point or do their pairings. So. Um, it's so problem, weird because it's not like a normal like tournament bracket, right? Like normally like. Like, like ISC gets matches. lowest seed and like yeah. goes down that way. Because there's no like pre pre seedings, right? Like you have no idea who's like the best or worst player. So you could go like, for instance, I had a tournament in Tennessee one time, but like the first round, I drew a Warhound Titan, <laughs> and I got a hundred points because that thing was just <laughs> it was dead turn two, and I just maxed everything. So you go there, and it's like, well, that's how do you how do you measure your hundred points? Versus the guy that won 65 to 50 playing a crazy close matchup when they're the two best players in the tournament. You know what I mean? It's weird. It's weird. I think it's difficult to score. But either way, like whether you go win loss or you go points, I think it's not going to always end up being the top three best. Yeah, you're going to get the top. You're going to get the number one person. But the second and third place, I think, is going to be in a weird situation. Yeah, I can't wait for us to go to the GT and I somehow get Richard Siegler the first match. <laughs> it would be very funny. <laughs> Can I just forfeit? <laughs> I'm, uh, I think I'm done. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to waste your time today, sir. <laughs> no, I didn't. I. What's so crazy is last time I was at a U.S. Open, I had no idea who Art of War was or anybody. So I was at the Open with like Siegler. That's the one that Lennon actually won. Or was it the John Lennon? He was top three, I think. Actually, yeah, I think it was John Lennon versus Richard Siegler. And Siegler, I think that year actually won every U.S. Open. I may be incorrect on that. Yeah, Siegler did. I think he won every U.S. Open with the Admech and then was unable to make the like championship game, the championship where they invited every winner of the U.S. Open. So it was just four Siegler invitations and then he couldn't show up. <laughs> well I'm pretty sure he's like a PhD student or something. Yeah, he has a he has a PhD in uh, history. I think he specifically studies uh the is French war? French Revolution. <laughs> yeah the French Revolution. Which is a weird weird one to pick but yeah well, at least pick so. a better fucking country. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. Like I, I would really like to face Siegler, I think from 
from what I've seen on all the the videos, most of them seem cool. I've. Did you hear about the drama with Battlescribe? Yeah, I did. Actually, I saw that this morning. Yeah, so really interesting. Everybody's tuning into the podcast to listen to lore, and here we are talking about tabletop <laughs> shit. Um, so Battlescribe went off of the App Store, which is the tool that everybody used to build their lists and play the game. Um, did you see we, why that happened? Well, for a while, all the YouTube videos were coming out saying that they hadn't done any updates to it, and therefore it was out of line with the yeah, like clients or whatever clients. but the the owner of battle scribe the app posted on twitter which for like the first time in like four years we thought he was gone <laughs> <laughs> he or she i don't know they're a uh, unanimous this this saint this patron person <laughs> who has literally made it to where it's possible to play in 40k tournaments without having a massive fucking headache every time <laughs> you go uh this like, saint of a person um they just had an expired credit card. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and the entire 40k community, thousands of people are oh like, "Oh my god, god, what do we do? Don't don't delete it." <laughs> it prompted like tons of backlash to the Games Workshop app because all of a sudden people were like, "Wait, we're gonna have to use the Games Workshop app now?" And oh god, like, this is dog shit. Dog. It's so bad. <laughs> and like, I actually have people. I'm in a group message of people now that play Warhammer and Lexington, and they were like. Um, they're like, oh yeah, we'll just use the GW app. And I don't think most of these guys aren't very um, like turn them. They don't uh, they don't go to a lot of tournaments and just are really big in the hobby, which is totally cool. But I was like, hey, like, don't do <laughs> don't do it. I tried to make a list. It's impossible. Like most armies, it's impossible to make a list. Like it doesn't work. Like I can't like put prototype systems on my tau units. <laughs> it doesn't work. There's no way to give them warlord traits and relics. That's not a thing you can do. I just, I'm like, how, what is this list building tool? This is not, uh, it's so, and you pay for that one. <laughs> Fucking GW. It's great. The, the Art of War guys were on a podcast earlier this week talking about, talking about that situation. And I think it was Brad. I don't know how familiar you are with the, the group of guys. Brad and John Lennon are the guys that do the podcast, but they were talking about the, the GW app and how people would have to use that now. And these guys, I do enjoy the Art of War guys, but they are very friendly, very friendly. The shells? To, very friendly to GW. <laughs> I understand why. I understand why they have to be because that's their business. But at, when that was mentioned, like you could tell both of them were like, no, fuck that app. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was, no, I had a fun time there. So yeah, that's the state state of the game. <laughs> a little bit, little interesting tidbits. If you guys have opinions on uh, the GW app or point scoring systems for tournaments, let us know. I'm interested to know because it's. I don't think there's a really good solution for either of the two, other than GW hiring competent developers. <laughs> Yeah. Also, if you'll be in Chicago for the GT, hit us up. Oh, absolutely. Let us know. We'd love to like meet you guys for sure. Like get you a drink or something. No, no, no. Uh, they buy us drinks. I don't. I don't. I don't we're, think we're, we're celebrities, that. right? That's uh, how that works. Popular. I think it's more like, oh my gosh, you've heard <laughs> Wait, us. Wait, you listen to us for like <laughs> more than an hour? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we're yes. very poor after this event. If you're coming to the U.S. Open in Chicago or Kansas City, I'll be the one in Kansas. I'll be at the one in Kansas City. But in Chicago, me and Bill will both be there. It'd be a good time for sure. Let us know. Yes. Path of Heaven. Path of Heaven. <laughs> we are here to preview Path of Heaven by Chris Reit. I really like him. Yeah. Very Chris, good author. Solid writer. Super good. He... I think that the thing about Chris Ray is he is uh, the most consistent writer, I would say. He doesn't have a lot of weaknesses in his writing, but I'm also not like mind blown by a lot of things that he does. Like, I think he yeah, just I like. I'd say goes like ADB Chris Dan. It's a little rough. It's rough for me to judge it like that because only Graham McNeil has made me put a book down. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, the thing with Graham is he's very like 
the most inconsistent. It's god tier or dog shit, and there's like not much in between. Let's say dog shit. <laughs> next time Dude, we have re read Outcast Dead. Oh, uh, I don't <laughs> want to. But next time we have it on our podcast, you can be like, I listened to the shit you guys said about me. <laughs> Graham, please. I know you said you don't regret writing in your books, but Outcast Dead, are you sure? <laughs> But Chris, Chris Ray is a very, very good author. Um, so this book is basically the pickup from the Scars. Scars yeah, book. I think we should hit on how Scars ended because we had the two short story prequels mm-hmm. before Scars. And like, I forgot what happened to like Shaban for the first like 10 minutes. I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with him? I, still- I was like, oh, yeah. I still don't remember what happened to Siobhan. I just kind of rolled with it. Like, I couldn't remember, (laughs) and I was like, okay, something happened. (laughs) Yeah, so just a reminder for Scars. At the end of Scars, we had the big battle of the Khan and Mortarion, and then while that was happening, there was also a revolt-type-esque thing happening on... What's their main ship called? Storm Sword? Sure. There's a revolt going on Excellent. in there, and it was basically Torgon's side and Shaban's side fighting for their loyalty. Yeah, well, during of, that. Yeah, part of the the scars actually ended up originally in the Book of Scars. They they were wanting to pledge the loyalty of the Legion to Horus, so there was some rebel rebellion within the scars itself. Yeah, and that's very big because we kind of see what happened to the people that they let live from that. But when that was happening, it got to the point where, you know, Shaban's the hero. So he's gets into like the main cockpit and he finds Ilya. That's her name, right? The human. Yep. And they get to the teleportation thing. But like as he gets there, like he just gets fucked up and it's kind of like at the end of scars it's kind of implied that he was gonna die mm. and then and like a page later is like and i'm back but it wasn't as bad as the harial in yeah. his wake up <laughs> yeah so what what is kind of interesting so they they were able to save him but what is talked about a couple times in this book is other legionaries believe that in other legions he would have become a dreadnought He was that damaged where, like, he was in that unconscious state. They were able to bring him back. But interestingly, it seems to me, based off the context of the book, that the White Scars don't believe in Dreadnoughts. Like, they don't do that. Yeah, which is very interesting. Because at one point in the book, he talks about how he's kind of annoyed with how superstitious the Scars are because he would have been a Dreadnought if it wasn't for that. Yeah. Dreadnoughts are badass. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, now he's just a fucking Iron Hand, which is worse. Yeah, he does. And unfortunately, in this book, in my opinion, he comes off very Iron Handy. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> there's a lot of Iron Hand stuff. Not saying that there's not some good character development there. Um, but yes, he is. He's for the majority of the book, very metal and very metal esque in his mind. He is very firm on things. Flesh is weak. Yeah, so what's happening basically after the Khan rejects Mortarion's offer to join Horus, um, there is the the forces that were rebelling against Horus, or sorry, not rebelling, the forces that were siding against Horus, uh, they were actually sentenced to die. But the Storm Series Sugi, uh, who's a very important character in this book as well, he was actually able to convince the Khan to do something else with them. Yeah, and that was, I think it's talked about in one of the short stories afterwards. It might have been in the prologue. They talked about it in Scars, what would happen to them at the end. But we didn't see that happen until we got the short story, the prequel short story of Torgon, Torgon, um, Torgon. Fighting, fighting with the um, Sons of Horus, but they were the Lunables at the time. Yeah, so what happened was, if you don't recall, they are basically just sent out to die fighting and to like earn their honor for betraying the Khan. 
Yeah, it was actually really well written, the concept of this. So basically the idea that Yusuke told the Khan was, hey, Horus was successfully able to infiltrate your legion and turn a major or turn some of them against you. Now, Horus, for, for Horus, this is a win-win, right? Like he's taking some of your legion away, regardless of what you do. But what if instead, because they realized, and you see it in this book, it's actually very funny, this, the, the, this scene um, that I'm thinking of, but the, the people that were siding with Horus realized they were wrong after Prospero. So you see, you say, well, it even wronger when they see like current children. chaos infested legions. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> we wanted to be that? that, that that's a snake thing. Great scene. <laughs> Phenomenal scene. Yeah. But yeah, Torgon's like, Jesus Christ. I, so, I really would have been fine with death. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be but, dead than a snake. Yeah. So um, basically, Yusugi convinced Jack and Ty that how about they fight? to get their honor back by going basically what you would call the the front lines, the vanguard, essentially. They go in death companies to die, literally, to regain their honor. Um, so they're sent out from the rest of the Legion. And the remaining force of the Legion basically employs White's card tactics to fight the, the Traitor Legions by hit and run, um, a lot of feints that happens a lot in this book. You know, they attack here, but they're really going to attack here. And this is ha this happens for four years. This is a four year gap in between the book of scars and here. And the whole time, the scars are doing just hit and run tactics on traitor legions. Yeah, and what's really cool too is Ilya, the human, just questioning like. Bro, what the fuck are you guys doing? She legitimately <laughs> talks like that. It is it is a breath of fresh air. Yeah, she she's like just so she's like ripping out her hair like fresh. Like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, so as they do the hit and run tactics, Ilya obviously in the beginning of this says, Hey, let's go to Terra. Let's help Dorn defend that. And Jack Ty says, Hey, that's not the way. Uh, later on in the book, and we'll discuss this in the review, but there's a really great scene between Horace and Mortarion that we were actually talking about before this. Where Horace kind of gives an update of the war and he talks about all the loyalist primarchs. And this was kind of a big aha moment for me, too, where he's like, hey, Gilliman, Sanguinius and the lion are all trapped by the storm. Uh, Corvus Corax has like 15 people. He like legitimately says that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Vulcan's dead. Ha ha. <laughs> Paris is dead, which may not even be true anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he says uh, that Lehman Russ and Dorn, or I mean, Dorn's obviously on Terra. Lehman Russ is licking his wounds. And he kind of had this like this big statement, which kind of blew my mind. The Khan is the only one fighting them. Yeah. So like a big thing when it comes to importance of the heresy, a lot of people don't think Jack Ty is very important. Um, he is the, for a majority of the heresy, I'd say, 75% of the heresy, pretty much the only primary legion that is fighting all of the traitors. We're talking Iron Hands, Emperor's Children, Death Guard, and Sons of Horus. Not Iron Hands, Iron Warriors, my bad. <laughs> Iron Hands, it's hard to remember. <laughs> it's just the White Scars, which is crazy to think about, that they've been able to survive that for four years. Which, there's also, every time, like, Time Light's brought up, I have no idea what's happening. Because so, at two years was Kalth, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I so think, I, yeah, I, I think, think Kalth. So. I'll, 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 maybe it does make more sense because isn't Pharaoh's well, two years post Kalth? Yeah, so this would be around. This makes so, more sense now. This is actually Scars takes place after Vengeful Spirit. Not Scars, sorry. Path of Heaven takes place after Vengeful Spirit. Around the same time as Pharos is what I'm expecting. Um, we know it takes place after Vengeful Spirit because uh, Moloch is mentioned a couple times in this book. Um, other than that, I can't really think of other events that are currently happening. Moloch is mentioned. Angron's change is mentioned. Yeah, so it does take place after Betrayer, after Vengeful Spirit. This is probably, this and Ferris are probably the most up-to-date current yeah, like stuff that we have been given. 
um, as far as books go. The short stories, who fucking knows? <laughs> like, who <laughs> short stories is bullshit. It <laughs> can be like ten years in the future. Like, who knows? Um, the Emperor's so, on a throne. Yeah. So, Ilya, very important character here in my mind. She's she is. Chris Wright does such a good job because there's no like Loken character anymore. Like he spreads that character out amongst the many characters. Ilya is the reader's voice. Yeah. Ilya's Which, like, what you... This is another great thing is it finally gave us a human again. Oh, she there's is such so a many fucking space burns. I don't give a shit about because at the end yes. of the day, like if they die, like whatever, they're, that's kind of what they're made for. Right. Yeah. And this book talks a lot about how she's like, old and she's feeling worthless but and but the the scars really respect her but she thinks maybe they're mocking her so it's a very like human very human viewpoint of this like self-doubt they a lot of this the entire book is actually based off of her plan so they the venture that they have she's like we need to get back to Terra. there's they all the other routes are closed off after four years of fighting the legions have blocked them in Jagatai's like, all right, fine. Now I'll listen to you, which really screws her over. And so she's pissed because she's like, okay, we had 27 routes a year ago and now we have zero. Here's like a long shot, basically, is what the, the book is at, about. Yeah, which is, it sucks for her, right? I mean, even in like Scars, we had this whole thing about how the White Scars just can do whatever the fuck they want and how she was sent there to try to like make them realize like hey you gotta have some logistics around what the fuck you're doing yes and what yes. happens they fuck themselves by not listening it's just like god damn it yeah <laughs> there's a there's also a really interesting i really like the white scars like it's it's rough because like i love both the white scars and the salamanders i as i, I like them both coming in um the salamanders were my favorite and the white scars were probably my second favorite but as i read the books the salamanders have come down and the white scars have come up and so it's hard to just keep going down. down yeah every time they say vulcan lives it's just another notch <laughs> it's not on it's not on the graph anymore my man i cannot wait there's got to be like some sometime whenever i have a salamanders army and i face you I'm just going to say Vulcan lives every time I do anything. Like every time I kill one of your models or make a charge. Vulcan lives. <laughs> in the exact same tone that he does in the audiobook. Vulcan We're about to get lives. a Horus Heresy set so you can have Vulcan too. Oh, I'm just. <laughs> Even if he dies, just pick him you back can't up. Have, Vulcan you can't have lives. Vulcan. You can't have Vulcan. He you has to be Heresy, conceptual. He has a model. Oh, he, he. I know you can, but like. You just keep if resting. You have, if you have Vulcan in your army, Vulcan lives as an obvious mantra. He's got to be dead, or you have to think he's dead for you to be able to say Vulcan lives. Just have him laid down the whole time, just moving. <laughs> he's just on the side. He's not roll, even roll a d6. <laughs> Every time they do something a little bit, you just shake him a little bit. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Does Vulcan live this round? Oh, it's an even. He lives. <laughs> that would be the funniest fucking mechanic. <laughs> it's better than the fucking Karns. Uh, yeah <laughs> oh i'm near so i'm near one of my my army fucking kill it mortal wounds I'm like, why mortal why wounds. is that a thing <laughs> yeah card's like the most like level-headed of them all yeah <laughs> so going back a little bit to the scars tactics and why i originally said i like them so much it's like you read them during these four years the hit and run especially Shabon, but it's happening to everybody else. They're losing their spirit. Those White Scars are a very spirited legion. They're big on the planes. Like, they're just happy. Like, it's a big thing where they say, like, they don't only want to die in combat, they want to die laughing. Yeah. Like, it's a thing where, like, they're warriors. They're free. Freedom is very big for them. Jacketai, it's it's shown very many times, doesn't have a great relationship with the Emperor, and a lot of that is because he doesn't believe in this anti-religion thing. He's just like, let people believe. He's very, it's just a free spirit. And I really think you would, you would be very hard-pressed to find a Legion with a better common sense about them than the White Scars. Yeah. It's what America wants to be. It is. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> um the only unfortunate thing i will give minus two points this book 
There's no fucking jet bikes. Isn't Tor? Even when we're introduced to Torgon, he He's has a jet, bike, a jet bike for like a minute. For like a <laughs> minute. There's no other. He jet literally bike. hops off of it, and then that's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of disappointing. Because I mean, you think white scars? You think jet bikes? Scars a book, but no jet bikes. <laughs> uh, we also get. Um, couple of things here so Horace is obviously very pissed off that Jack has just been a thorn in his side so he's going to send his brother Tyrion to deal with it there's another person already dealing with it he's your favorite character who I mean the the actually I'd say your third favorite character because we all know your favorites are Erebus and Corfarion. <laughs> so your third favorite character has to be I don't know who's my third favorite character at this point I mean, it's backwards, obviously. I'm trying to think. Holy shit. Why is my brain shut up? Oh, Ed- Edelon. It's got to be Edelon. <laughs> the dude died and he comes back to life just to, <laughs> just to be annoying. So Edelon and Mortarion are now working together. I really want to do a quick timeout here. What makes no sense to me about Edelon? So in Horus Rising, right? Mm-hmm. He was made to be a fucking idiot. Like, he was, like, someone that was, like, how is this guy in his... When we met him at murder. ...position, yeah, like... Yeah. He killed all of us, basically, because he's an arrogant prick. Right. And now he's, like, actually, like, respected and, like, doing things that isn't dumb. Very, very big change of character on him. So I think it's pretty evident that after his death, he became more powerful. Not only was he resurrected and some weird shit that we don't really know how um he also is part of the cacophony cacophony the noise marines he's a noise marine now which i didn't realize how many of those fuckers there were but apparently a there's a bunch of noise marines out there oh they were like elites but apparently not no they're just regular troops i mean they do some damage but uh they're everywhere yeah i mean the wise scratch like what the fuck do we do about this yeah um see there's a couple um pretty key characters uh there's a an emperor's children named cario um he is what they call a palatine blade palatine blade is that what they do that's what they're called yeah he is basically an interesting thing about this emperor's children character he he is not demoned up yet which is incredibly rare <laughs> he, t- yeah. he does but it's interesting because, like, the whole time he's like, one day. But not today. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't ready for that shit yet. He's been refusing, like, the warp gifts and stuff, but he's also, like, extremely Emperor's Children. It's so annoying whenever I see an Emperor's Children. It happens a lot, like, more than a lot. But they're like, I'm the best fighter of the Emperor's Children. I'm like, you and every other fucking dude I read about, the Emperor's <laughs> Children. <laughs> I'm only convinced of Lucius, and that's it. And he died to a Raven Guard. <laughs> of all fucking legions. <laughs> I feel it would have been a word bear would have been worse, but a Raven Guard still? Based off the legitimate text that we have, you all kind of suck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he has this, like, vendetta um, around, like, a uh, fourth of the way through the book. First, he wants to kill Shaban so bad. What's it? really wants to kill Shabon. Um, and at the same time, we have a couple other Emperor's children. You have the Castles with you? I do. Uh, there's an Emperor's children, like Vol something. He's an apothecary. Uh, yeah, he was actually the first one. Like... Von Calda. Oh, apothecary okay. in Equerry to Lord Commander Edelon. Yeah, so... He, the, the apothecaries and the Emperor's children are super revered more than any other legion because they can do weird shit to your body. <laughs> that, that's that's literally what it is. Um, and he also is a psyker. I think that's a little bit of a spoiler. I don't yeah. know. Maybe, maybe. Also, I think something we should talk about real quick too is Edelon's yeah. current. I don't want to. See... Army now. Is like not even with Fulgrim anymore. He's just like yeah. his own army. He's like, fuck Fulgrim. Let's go. And point. he just has like a whole like different Emperor's children with him. Yeah, it's 
so this takes place obviously after Angel Exterminatus. We have no, still there's no like answer to where Portorabo is, but apparently no one knows where Fulgrim is. This actually comes up in the conversation in Horus and Retarion. Retarion's like, have Fulgrim do it. He's like, well, fuck, like if you know where he is. <laughs> Let me you know. find that snake bastard. I can't find him. <laughs> yeah. So Edelon was apparently with Fulgrim, and then Edelon was like, like, fuck this. Like, this guy's weird. He's doing a lot of pleasure stuff right now, which is like so Fulgrim for his children thing. Like, <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> I really hope that what happens is like Fulgrim shows up to the Siege of Terra. He's like, this is boring as shit. <laughs> Just leaves. <laughs> <laughs> I can't fuck anything here. (laughs) (laughs) There's a big ass wall. What do you want me to do about it? (laughs) Is there any holes? Oh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Blood guns? I'm interested. Sir, uh, we actually decided that it would be smarter to keep the butt plugs off of the walls and our shoulder pads and our guns because the Emperor's children just weren't interested and left after we took them <laughs> off. <laughs> Holy <Yeah>. shit. <laughs> Got rid of a fifth of their army by removing all butt plugs from the <laughs> from Terra. <laughs> Quick, put the butt plug bullets back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Fulgrim's just out doing nothing. So Edelon has his own little command. He's got this apothecary. He's working in some warp magic stuff. Another thing that I would love to talk about is the Death Guard and how just fucking stupid the Death Guard are right now. Mortarian included. Well, we've Mortarian. Done that in a while. I know. <laughs> Mortarian's like, yo, psychic shit. That ain't that's not good. Let's pass on the psychic stuff. Meanwhile, he is completely delving into the psychic shit. (laughs) (laughs) And he's also got that demon thing, Grugalore, from Vengeful Spirit in in his um, ship. On top of that, he knows that everybody else in his ships, because they're kind of dispersed before this, when they come together, he's all like, well, I know you guys are doing weird warp shit, but let's cut that out when we're when we're together. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so much just, just stupid shit going on with the Death Guard of just denying they're in like a hundred percent denial that they're diving into the psychic shenanigans. And honestly, like every time we talk about like the traitor legions, none of them really have anything like good going for them. Yeah, I, mean, I would have been like Lord Bears big... killed themselves, which is fucking terrible. World leaders <laughs> kill themselves. <laughs> I mean, the Emperor's children do more than kill themselves. Oh, they do some weird shit together. Yeah. So I mean, Sons of Horus, they're kind of okay, I guess. Yeah, we if we ever like hear anything from them, they're supposed to be just be like this like big bad thing that no one really talks about anymore. Yeah, supposed we're, just, to, <laughs> we're yeah. supposed to give a shit, but we don't anymore. Yeah, I mean the Iron Warriors were really cool until Iron Fire came along. <laughs> Iron Fire, and now they're just killing <laughs> themselves. And they're also killing themselves. <laughs> Look, we're gonna drop virus bombs, but we're gonna be in the middle of it. It's gonna be sick. <laughs> oh, jeez, Iron Fire. Yeah, so it's kind of. A- <laughs> Uh, got super off track. I know I was on a topic. <laughs> it was about yeah, the Emperor's children. So <laughs> there is a bit of a power struggle, as always, in the Emperor's children. You have Cario, the Palatine Blade. He wants to go do his own thing. When the War Master tells Edelon, "Hey, you're gonna go ahead and be um." working with Mortaria and Edelon's like well, fuck that I'm just gonna go somewhere <laughs> else I don't want to work for that guy <laughs> and you know, so he, I don't even blame him <laughs> yeah he's about to leave and Cario's like no we're gonna go I want to kill Shaban and then Edelon's like well shit I'm turned on now he sold me that's basically what happens that guy's got butt plugs wow well, all right literally Cario comes into the room and is like we're gonna go kill Shabbat. And Edelon's like, well, fuck. 
<laughs> You're kind of cute. to tempt me with a good time, big boy. <laughs> I love how assertive you are. <laughs> Although he's like, mouth is off. I'm just like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I love how assertive you are. <laughs> I have a really hard time. Like the whole. What's the audio book like for this? I haven't. I, I refuse to listen to it because oh, I know damn. <laughs> half of the characters are going to talk like robots. And I hope that like. That's never, if it ever becomes like a show or anything, I hope that's never a thing because that would be so painful. Edelon just needs to speak, he needs to say, Oh, I'm so intrigued. <laughs> Not, <laughs> Oh, I am so intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think he's, it doesn't have like a robotic voice though. He's like, just like fucking like destroyed. So I'm imagining like, uh, I am so intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> Like, if, uh, fuck, what's his name? Like, Christopher Walken, if he just, like, smoked for, like, 60 years straight. That's yeah, kind of how I imagine. Christopher Walken. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about Christopher Walken's smoking habits, but if I had to guess. <laughs> well, that's how I imagine that on talk. It's just Christopher Walken. Yeah. <laughs> so, there's some, obviously, some power struggles in the Emperor's Children. And some demon shit gets mixed up in it because that's how they do their things uh but basically the crux of the story is Ilya has an idea of how to get back to terra so they're trying to chase after a astropath not astropath sorry um navigator who lives in the section of space um, that is not blocked off by the warp storms so the scars are kind of bounced around trying to chase them and then these guys are chasing scars the death guard and the emperor's children so all in all phenomenal book i finished it today dylan's still trekking through yeah about 30 35 percent of the way through it yeah that's a it's a really good one um i had a struggle i kept falling asleep reading it not because it was a bad book at all i just think i have like a really bad sleep schedule right now <laughs> See, i've had i've actually had an issue reading it too i've just had like a problem with like keep it keeping my attention like i really like it but like my brain just keeps like wandering off it's definitely one that i've enjoyed chapter by chapter instead of trying to sit down with long periods of reading i don't know why it's a very good book and every time i put it down i want to pick it back up uh, but yeah i do wish the chapters were shorter like i feel like scars were like short chapters which is why i really liked it well nick time does very short chapters Yes, which is very great. It's a, mm-hmm. especially like if, if you're someone like me, like I can't stop a chapter. I have to finish the fucking chapter. Yeah, which is an author we missed entirely. It was Nick Kime, and uh, I think Nick Kime's very good as well. Um, and it's I think a lot of it is just due to the short chapter stuff. But yeah, I have a hard time like stopping in the middle of a chapter as well. Yeah, I mean, you gotta finish up the, the plot that's happening. Yeah, not to mention the fact now. I'm now uh, we're in the region of books where like getting a physical copy is nearly impossible for a majority of these books. Not for a fucking r- realistic price. Yeah, I've looked at Amazon. Majority of books, there, there's a couple of them you're going to pay over $200 for. Um, and I hate that I'm saying this with people listening because now they're going to go sell their fucking books for $200. You pieces of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what the fuck, guys? We can't find them. I mean, yeah. honestly, like me going, like, I think I said this like when I bought my Kindle. Like, I did the math, and my like hundred dollar Kindle actually saved me like two hundred to like forty dollars. Oh yeah, I mean, you're not paying; you're easily paying over fifty dollars for a for a book at this point. Yeah, I'm like Praetorian of Dorn, like you can't find cheap. I got Praetorian of Dorn. Fuck you, all right? <laughs> it was 40 bucks, though, so... Still, yeah. Uh, Which is cheaper than what you normally find it for. Master of Mankind, like, if I didn't have... If oh I didn't buy goodness. that when it was to order, like, I... There's no way. Eye of Terra is 250 bucks. Yeah, Eye of Terra is nuts. Stupid expensive. Which is... It's an anthology. Yeah, it makes no sense. What the fuck? There's some books that yeah, I legitimately cannot find in paperback. And that is, I cannot find the actual, like, original print of Angel Exterminatus. That's not the hard copy, like, the, the large copy. Oh, yeah. 
and I cannot find fucking Wolfsbane to save my life. It's so funny that you can't find a Wolfsbane. I've had a Wolfsbane for months. <laughs> it's impossible. I might need you to photocopy it for me. <laughs> I got a copier. It's a I lot. don't know if it'll read it. <laughs> it's getting expensive. I'm so surprised. Like, I post in like a lot of um, like Warhammer community stuff on Facebook, and oh my god, I loved it when you sent a list, and I was like, hey, I actually have one of your books. <laughs> like I have three book. copies of one of the anthologies, and I was like, "How the fuck do I have three copies?" <laughs> <laughs> one is yours. One was Tales of Heresy. From... No, it wasn't Tales of Heresy. Age of Darkness, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, we got one from like Daniel had a bunch of like extra ones that he sent us like a long time ago, like when we first started the podcast. Yeah. yeah, I know he likes you more because he actually sends you books. Damn it, Dave. Hey man, it's like it's all good. I don't tell you. You gotta it be more active. Is. I I gotta be a better person. <laughs> <laughs> you don't join the hobby meetups. I don't know what to tell you. I did last time. I'm working on it. I'm trying. Yeah, we're about to do another one of those. I got got a decent amount done. Hi, uh, we have some cool people in our Discord. Or our hobby meetups are phenomenal. Every, every time I've gone, it's been great. Yeah, yeah. people people are really good. Mm-hmm. Still trying to. As soon as I get my work certification, I'm I'm getting the knights. I've been like thinking in my mind, like, okay, Gavin, don't just go buy the knights. You need to paint the fucking Death Guard. I don't even want Death Guard. It pisses me off that I own Death Guard. It's fucking Connor's fault. Yeah, our, our friend. We wanted to con- convince him to play. We bought him a Death Guard box, and he never put it together, and he never played. He actually has played with me once. Um, and he's like not bad. Like he like, grasps the game. Phenomenal. I mean, he's very good at like strategic games. Yes, he's like really good at them. Like, I think he would be really good at this game if he played it. But he uh, just he's too cool. <laughs> yeah, he'd rather, rather like go out. And we're like, how about? I'm old. <laughs> I'm old. I drink. I drink porters inside and talk about books that I read. <laughs> like I'm <laughs> some real. sort of like I'm some sort of middle aged suburban woman. Yeah, I feel. Tr- trust me, I feel that. <laughs> but now we had, so we had this big. We actually bought him the battle box or whatever it was. The the combat. That no, was just the combat patrol, yeah. And um, I had, he had the combat patrol and he had the codex. And I'm like, well, shit. Like now that we have that, like we can't like just not get a two thousand point army. So I've been buying boxes with my tournament winnings. So I've got another box of Terminators and another box of Plague Marines. And we're at like 1,700 points of Death Guard, actually. But none of it's put together. None of it's painted. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually recently saw a like Death Guard lot on eBay. It was like 400 bucks. And I was like, honestly? Good price. Yeah, it was really good. For, and like, it was already painted. It sucks because Death Guard are, like, in my opinion, dog shit on the tabletop. Yeah, I actually saw so Goonhammer the day that we're recording this, eight twenty-five, released like their like tier list and I'm very uh, skeptical of that tier list, by the way. Oh yeah, which one which ones didn't you like on it? Because Sodes being like the lowest tier, I'm like, are you fucking crazy? I haven't I haven't heard much about them in Nephilim. Cause Sodes are still really good. They're still really good. It's hard. I think it's going to be hard to like. I don't think they're like an S tier army by any means. I think like people who have really good secondaries are S tier armies. Some people are saying like Tau is S tier. I don't agree with that. Like I, I really struggle to outscore my opponent because my my like secondaries are very stoppable and other people's are not. So. I, yeah. I have a hard secondary game. Tao has a, a decently hard secondary game. Well, other people don't, like Necrons and Sisters are just crazy good. But Custodes, it's hard to make Custodes not good. Because just having a four up involved, you're, you could win. Like, even just having shit secondaries, you're going to win at least 45% of your games. That's what's so crazy about them. 
I have a lot of yeah, videos. maybe it's just not so. like a lot of people are playing them or something because I think it was also based off of like tournament results. Yeah, they're not. I mean, they're not an unpopular army, but yeah, I would imagine like the lowest are probably Gene Steeler Colts. I think guard are actually really good right now. Um, I'm so scared to see what happens when demons come out. I'm sure that what they had in their bottom tier. They had Astromil- Militarium, which they is had not true. Custodes, not true. Uh, Mechanicum. Fair enough. I'll say Mechanicum's pretty bad right now, as far as win rates go. The problem with Mechanicum is they're a very, very hard army to play. Yeah. So like Richard Siegler could take Mechanicum and like kill a tournament easily but it's just because he knows it so well so like mechanicum can be really good it's just really hard to play so i'm i'm okay with him being low tier because i think to the majority of the community they are yeah i'm trying to think like i think that was it for that tier probably gene stealer colts i'd say oh yeah gene stealer colts was down there which Top is crazy was in depth of serratus i don't know yeah um necrons necrons and tyranids yeah tyranids are Pretty damn okay. good. Tau's Next. probably second tier. A lot of people think Tau's top tier, like I said. I, I yeah, they had Tau, play. second tier. Um, probably a lot of space Chaos Marines. Space Marines. There was like only like two legions of Space Marines, I probably think. Black Templars. Um, I, honestly, I could probably just pull them up. So I was bullshitting that. Yeah. We got a few more minutes. We can talk about this. Yeah, I want to. Competitive. To be honest, now that everything has settled down, now that Nephilim's been out for quite a bit, I am okay to say I think the game is is uh, very well balanced at the moment. Yeah. Okay. I really do. Here are it's... the two. Here is the tier list that Goonhammer released. Uh, tier one, which is like the top tier, is Necrons, Adeptus Riotus, and Tyranids. Tier two is Tau, Harlequins. Death Guard, Chaos Knights, Chaos Space Marines, Thousand Sons, Drakari, Orcs. And this has good Space Marines, which are Blood Angels, Dark Angels, Iron Hands, and then Imperial Knights. Tier 3 is Iron right, Knights. Let's hold, up. Let's, hold okay. up. let's go back. Okay. How many tiers, first off? Is it four tiers? Four tiers. Okay. All right. So they said Death Guard. Dude, here's the problem. This is what Death Guard is. Death Guard is Death Guard is a gatekeeper for your just abilities at the game, I think. Like the it's not even how much you know your army, it's just kind of how much you've played the game to realize how you beat Death Guard. And the answer is just just get behind them. The answer is outmaneuver them don't give them charges what's so crazy about death guard is they move slower in their movement phase than they do in the charge phase if you give them yeah i mean like they move five inches everybody moves five inches so if you give them a six inch charge more than likely going to make that they move faster there and then they get six inches of pile and consolidate so it's really just not giving them charge targets, taking them down in psychic, taking them down in shooting. And if you're if you're like Blood Angels or something, make sure you're the one that charges. You have 12 inch movement. It's so easy to beat Death Guard, in my opinion. Like I wouldn't say it's easy. They're they're a challenge. Like it's a it's a question that you have. But as soon as like Death Guard just don't win tournaments because as soon as you face somebody that knows how to play against death guard it's over for you that's my opinion though i don't think death guard are that good who else do we have in this second tier that uh, was tau harley quinn's death guard chaos knights chaos space marines thousand sons Drakari, orcs they said good space marines which are blood angels dark angels iron hands and okay, Imperial stop. Knights. okay okay um I'd agree with most most of that, I would say so. Um Yeah, I think that's fine. I think a lot of these a lot of these armies though, they get into that tier be- only because of certain lists, right? Which I think you really need to separate from. Like Knight Imperial Knights 
a thousand suns um are really only in that tier because they have like one viable build yeah um same thing with chaos knights i think um so like you can like build that a very particular way and run it and people are like for thousand suns for instance like you need to either have a big ass terminator block or you need an allied chaos knight uh, and then potentially, I think they're going to get a lot better here if you ally Siege Demons in, because I think that's going to be a thing you can do uh, with the new Chaos Codex. But yeah, I think that's fine. Orcs is a questionable one for me. I've seen Orcs. they've won some like r- random tournaments lately. Really? Mm-hmm. That's what I like about Nephilim. It's like they things will kind of surprise the shit out of you. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> Going into tier three, we have Grey Knights, Craft Worlds, then Medium Space Marines, which are Salamanders, Space Wolves, Black Templars, and Death Watch. Oh, I disagree with this. Black Templars are fucking great. You can do some great things with Black Templars. Uh, Grey Knights, I think, are dog shit right now, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> I really wish, and they actually talked about this in this uh, article, that Dread Knights got AOC. Yeah, like that wouldn't have even have broken anything. It would have been completely fine. The problem with Armor Contempt wasn't that the Dread Knights didn't get it. It's that now their AP means nothing. Yep. And Dread Knights are now worthless. Yeah, um, the, the shooting for Dread Knights is just so bad. And the only thing that they had was Dread Knights. And then they took that away. Eldar is another weird one. I think they're very similar to Mechanicum. They're, they're very, very hard to play faction. But if you do it right, you can make them S tier. It's the yeah. same thing. Like Eldar can be amazing. In the average player's hands, though, they're going to win less tournaments. Um, and that's why I think they're there. They, it's probably a lot based off tournament rankings. But I I like will shit the bed when I look at Eldar across the table. That's some scary shit. If the person, I the thing with Eldar is too is just, there's so many different units that like if you already like had an Eldar army, are you really gonna buy a bunch more units? So it's probably just not having the most efficient list. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, tier four we have left is Custodes, Mechanicum. Gene Stiller Colts, Asha Militaria, and then they called them Bad Space Marines, which are Imperial Fist, Amen, yeah. Raven Guard, uh, Amen, yeah. Ultra Marines, uh, and then the disgusting one, White Scars. How dare oh, I you say disagree White Scars that. as Bad Space Marines? I disagree with that, man. I've seen White Scars do some crazy shit today. Um, I disagree with that a lot. So, first off, I think that the, 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 the bad tier ones is a very poorly designed one. Custodes are good. Ultramarines? You can do shit with Ultramarines. The problem is, this is the problem. The people that made Ultramarines lists before Armor and Contempt, those lists are now bad, and now they just haven't bought new models to make their Ultramarines list viable in Nephilim. I think they'll be fine. Imperial Fist and Raven Guard, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> White Scars are, are still fucking great, though. I think White Scars are phenomenal. Um, Gene Sil- now, Astromail Tarum, this is, this is just a flat-out fucking lie. Astromail Tarum is now good. Running 10 commanders in Astromail Tarum, most armies don't know what the fuck to do against it. The guy that ran Astromail Tarum in my tournament last weekend, he... Tabled custodes, Dylan. Turn two. Yeah, dude, tier four. Huh? But yeah, dude, they're tier four. Tabled them, turn <laughs> two. That's just insanity. Now, a lot of people will say something like, you just need to tag on the combat. My Google Home just went crazy. So I wonder what happened there. Yeah. You just need to tag them in combat. That's true. It's a very big weakness of them. But there's a lot of armies that struggle even getting there. Uh, and it depends a lot on your deployment zone, your matchup, stuff like that. But I disagree a lot with this list. I don't think that's true. They're, if they're basing a lot on tournament wins, you have to look at the popularity of the army. Um, you have to look at how difficult the army is to play. Um, because you're going you're gonna to have people that win with 
shit tier armies because they're just really hard to play. And once they figure it out, your opponent's fucked. So that's just my opinion. I mean, I think that's like the, the cool thing about the game, too, is there's a bunch of armies that, I mean, no matter what, if you are actually like good at your army, you could probably hit a top table at a GT. Yeah, fair enough. If you're good at the game in general, just like understanding how you score points, I don't know if you can hit a top table at a GT or hit a top table at an RTT. I don't know. I mean, you, you saw what Siegler did with the fucking Mechanicum. Yeah, but that's like God tier. <laughs> I mean, he, he won like LVO with yes. Mechanicum, but I think if you really dive into it, if you're really good at an army, you're gonna get you're gonna get top tables as in like the top eight, but maybe not. Right yeah, which I mean, that's still good. Yeah, uh, the big problem right now, I, I really think the big issue with the tournament scene. I do think things need to be changed. I would like to have a conversation in our next like open end discussion about things I want to see for tenth edition because there's a lot of things I want to see. Yeah, perhaps um, a full revamp. Huh? That's what the re- the rumors are it's a full revamp. I don't know how I feel about that. I would love to talk about that at the end of um, Silent War. Uh, we'll have a conversation about it. But um, So for the current balance, I think it's phenomenal. The only problem is there's a lot of secondaries that I think need to be changed to make them more interactable. Like... Necrons and Sisters currently just score points. Even Imperial Knights, man. Imperial Knights score fucking points. You can't do anything yeah, even about Even just like weird things that like Engage got changed. It's kind of weird. Engage is so weird. I, you, I take Engage on... Oh, the only people I take Engage on is when I play Thousand Suns because they can teleport. But if you can't do that, then what's the fucking point on Engage? Yeah, like what's the difference at that point from... Broad. Or yeah, behind enemy lines, basically, you're only like a few inches off. Yeah, yeah, and then you're that's better. Um, it's a weird one. Behind enemy lines is shit, though. No one's ever gonna take <laughs> lines. Yeah, <laughs> secondaries need to be changed for sure. Like behind enemy lines is one of those things where like, if you do it, you should score like five points instead of three or four yeah. or what. That's my opinion, but yeah, because it's a lot more. A lot more difficult. Putting your army in, at risk, too. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, that's the state of the game. That is uh, Path to Heaven. Yes. Next week, we'll review it. Can't wait. Most likely talk only about Path of Heaven. Yeah, a lot more, <laughs> a lot more time dedicated. Yes. Um, as always, hit us up on the Discord. It's a lot of fun. You can find that pinned to the top of our Twitter at Heresy Lodge. If you like contributing to the podcast, we do have tips enabled there. Uh, we are on Tacticus. If you are interested in joining the guild, let us know. And I will see if there's any non-listeners in there that I can pick out. <laughs> you only get 20 slosh, which is stupid. I agree. Um, hopefully they expand that in the distant or the near Probably future. Not. Probably not. It's fucking GW. They're going to cancel this game. Um, you can email us at the theheresylogic.com. We are on YouTube. Please head over there, like, subscribe. You can always leave a comment as well. And that's it, guys. Next week we will have a review. Um, That's it. Have a good one.